I'm going to begin this conversation straight with you, Dr. Sneha. Um, our, our very topic talks categorically about breast cancer and the importance of early detection. How helpful is early detection? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sneha, consultant oncologist at GVK. And today is a very surreal day for me to be sitting with my lifetime favorite actress, Ms. Sonali, and a cancer rock star. She was a star and now a cancer rock star. Uh, Ma'am, I'm uh, very thankful for taking time out for this uh, cause because it is the need of the art today and people listen to you. So, Shazi, starting with your question, thank you for asking it at the beginning. How helpful is screening? Well, I can write a book of examples uh, to quote the patients that I've seen who've saved, uh, saved their lives with early screening and whose lives have been devastated by missing screening. So uh, to understand the importance of screening, let us get our facts on breast cancer right first. So like all cancers, breast cancer is also divided into four stages, stage one to stage four. And stage one, you should remember, is completely curable. And at stage one, the size of the tumor is less than two centimeters, a size that will not cause any signs or symptoms in your body, and you can't even feel it with your hand. So the only way to detect that smaller size of the tumor when it is in stage one and you can stand a chance of cure is to detect it through a mammogram. And I would like to quote an interesting experience I had. Uh, as a student, I was at a conference in Barcelona presenting some data on breast cancer statistics in rural Indian women. And I, it had a bar graph showing numbers from stage one to stage four. So there was a doctor from Finland across me and she was very shocked to see that chart. And she asked me, do you still have stage three and stage four in India? And I said, yes, and it is greater than 50% of the breast cancer burden in India. And uh, what she told me shocked me because she said the last we saw as a country, a stage three and a stage four breast cancer when, was my, when my grandmother was alive. So every woman in Finland gets a call from the government starting from the age of 40 to come and get a mammogram done. Well, I can't compare India to Finland. Finland is probably half the population of Hyderabad. <laughs> and, um, but what I would like to stress is that early screening has eradicated stage three and stage four from that country. That's how important it is. For, for them, breast cancer is a curable cancer. So, and for uh, stage one to go to stage four, it might take just two months or over a year. So if you don't catch it at that stage one, we might miss a chance uh, to stand a, you know, to stand a chance for cure. Every one of us sitting here carrying breast tissue on our body, the healthiest and the fittest, irrespective of your lifestyle, lifestyle choices or family history, have a chance of encountering this disease. God forbid, uh, if we encounter it, we better encounter it, encounter it early. So I think early screening is, the way to go to fight this epidemic. Absolutely. In fact, the other day I was uh, speaking to a whole bunch of people and they were of the opinion that there's a lot of hesitation. And I wonder why is there a stigma and a hesitation uh, since we are talking about screening and we are in a place where there's a lot of screening and everything happening. I'd like to ask you this question, Pinky Garu. Um, what was the vision behind setting up this place? I know it's fairly new. And I must say, I don't take one decimal credit for this fantastic pro property. It's thanks to my father-in-law. This is Mr. G. V. K. Reddy's passion. He wanted to give back to society. And uh, we have fantastic um, uh, technology, doctors, and, you know, and people who can afford it can pay. People who cannot afford, we give it free. So I think it's, it is good for giving back and we want to make this more <laughs> popular and we want to help a lot of people. So I think that's very important. And I don't think all my friends would want to hear me talk because they hear me all the time. <laughs> I think it's Sonali who needs to, uh, and she's my dear friend and who's, I have seen her really a fighter in, in all ways. I think she should talk, uh, really. Absolutely. My next question obviously is to you, Sonali ji. Um, I was just telling a little while ago, I, we met at um, an event 2018. I was moderating a panel discussion back in the day and I, along with a whole bunch of us, shortly thereafter was stunned by the news of that diagnosis. Um, since we're talking about detection, uh, could you share your moment of detection? How did you realize that something was amiss and what ensued after? Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's 
it's lovely to be here, thanks to Pinky, but uh, I've been hearing about this uh, initiative and she's been talking about it. I know she doesn't take any credit for it, but she's been talking about it, so making us aware of what is happening. And uh, health is something, obviously, after what I've gone through, I take a lot of interest in, so I was very keen on knowing what happens. And when she said that this is what we were planning, I said, of course, you know, it's my pleasure to be here. And it's great to see you all, and a lot of pinks also, so that's great that we followed the color code. Uh, but what doctor said was absolutely right, that uh, early detection saves lives is a slogan that we should all remember. Because uh, what uh, I realized is that cancer is a scary word. Uh, we feel that life has ended, everything comes to a standstill, but that's not true. If you detect cancer early, it's something that can be cured, that can be, uh, you know, treated, um, and we are talking about breast cancer and the statistics that she will give are much, I mean, I won't know those. I did not have breast cancer, but any cancer caught early, it has a much higher chance of, you, you know, uh, um, of curing it rather than, you know, it being the scary word that it is. So early detection does save lives. Um, I've been part of that brigade which says that, oh, I'm healthy, I don't need to uh, test, I don't need to do even a blood test. I mean, you know, we all say yearly health checkup, but you know, how many of us procrastinate about it and I'm we just don't. I'm the first one. Yeah. And my husband is always shouting at me that, get your test done. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, and we're just like always not. So I'm going to register myself there. We are, I want to see her do that. Yeah. But that's the thing, this is just going through it regularly and catching it early. It just, it, you know, saves you from so much more pain because uh, cancer is one of those diseases which I feel that the treatments for it are so much more harsher than the disease itself. So imagine if you could catch it early, you go through minimal invasive treatment and uh, later on when you have to go through very harsh treatments, for the rest of your life your body is shattered it's gone through what it has gone through your nerves are gone your veins are you know it's it's just such a harsh treatment so why why put yourself through that and um, that's why early detection is extremely important thank you thank you for that ma'am uh, and i'm i'm fairly certain a lot of us are feeling already plenty motivated pinky garu to begin with uh, <laughs> ma'am you just discussed the fact that it is a debilitating disease physically but it really takes a chunk out of you mentally as well, doesn't it? Mentally also, it really takes something out of you. I would like for you to kind of share a little about how was it to kind of, the will and the determination that mentally I've got to do this. But my son was very young, so that was my will and determination. I needed to survive for him was my, the thought in my head. I think most of us are, and actually, uh, um, you know, especially when I go to the hospitals, like when you go to Tata Hospital and all of, you know, uh, various places in our country, when you go to the smaller hospitals, and uh, you will never call me a warrior again. You will never say I'm strong again. If you see the women and how they deal with it. I've had a great support system. I'm blessed. I had everything that could be given. I mean, there are uh, women who are dealing who are pregnant, who are dealing with young children, who are dealing with the uh, families who are refusing to accept them back and think that it is their fault. I mean, when you see what they are going through and the treatment that they're going through and coming out of it, that is an eye opener for me. And you know, it just makes you f understand. I, re you know, you you realize how blessed you are. So I would say that it, whenever you go through something physically, of course, it takes a mental toll, and. Um, when you look at how fortunate you are, you look at the positive side of it, when you start to look for it, then suddenly the glass is half full rather than half empty. And I know these sound like cliches, but literally small things like that is what take you through. So um, through my treatment, there were two hashtags that I had formed. One was one day at a time and switch on the sunshine. And one day at a time was that's what it was. Because, you know, unless you... The moment you look at, oh my God, I don't know when the treatment is going to, it overwhelms you. So for me, it was like, let me get through today and I'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. Which helped me kind of live in the present, which is what our culture teaches us, which is what everybody and our parents have always told us, that live in the present. Easy to say, difficult to do, but that did help me do that. And switch on the sunshine. It's like switch it on. Every time you think you, something is pulling it down, you say, I'm going to switch it on. 
and look at the positive side of it and you know kind of start uh, thinking of it from that angle and that's how it is and then mind is definitely something it can make your body do amazing things and if you if you can get your mind to work with you in healing then your it will your body will heal it will it will uh, take to the uh, treatment much better beautiful so so lovely can we have a little bit of an applause for that i think <laughs> you know i mean i remember her when i f i went to visit her a couple of times yeah. in new york yeah. how many how, how many months were you in new york i was there for one year two years uh, you know, my first was was a six month chunk, and then yeah, two months. Yeah. And your son, how old was your little boy? Uh, when, uh, my son at, at that point was uh, was twelve when uh, I was diagnosed, and then uh, obviously he was thirteen year old through my treatment. Then yeah. We were just having a conversation about a twelve year old, and my heart is. <laughs> I'm going to contain that, <laughs> and we're going to move on to since we are talking about since the ball has Moving. been set. Yes. My question to you is, um, if I had to do an examination, a self-examination at home, how would I go about doing it? And um, could you share a few signs or symptoms that should be a red flag? Yeah. So uh, breast cancer screening has two modalities. One is a self-examination, and the other is an imaging through an ultrasound mammogram or a breast MRI. So breast self-examination is the most underused, the most powerful, DIY technique that you can do without stepping out of your house and which can catch this lump uh, early on. Uh, firstly, I would like to explain the technique of self-examination. There are three positions in what you have to do, a lying down position, a sitting, and then a standing. So when you lie down, preferably without your clothes, use the flat of your fingers. Do not examine or touch your breast with the tips of your fingers because normally br the breast tissue is made up of glands that produce milk and you may feel lobules. So uh, you might mistake it for an abnormal lump. So if you use the flat of your fingers, you would be better able to differentiate a really abnormal lump from a normal breast. So go clockwise or anti-clockwise using the flat of your fingers covering the entire area of the breast, applying adequate pressure. And then after you finish examining both the breasts, sit up, raise your arms, and one underarm at a time, examine both your underarms. Because the first place where the breast cancer can spread is to the lymph nodes in your armpit. So there can be lumps there as well. The, the last one, which you shouldn't miss doing, is some non-lump symptoms that you have to look for. Stand up and look at yourself in front of the mirror and notice the symmetry of the breast. Is there a change in the shape, in the size? And the nipple areolar complex is what you should also concentrate. Any recent pulling back of the nipple is a red flag sign. Some women have retracted nipples right from puberty, but that is not significant. A recent pullback of the nipple is significant. Any discharge from the nipple, any ulcer over the nipple, any changes on the skin of the breast, like in terms of color or texture, dimpling. So it's good to know all these signs, not just for ourselves, but we have a great amount of working women force in our homes who are, um, who don't have access to this information. And when they come up to you and say, Amma, I'm not, uh, this is something that's happening, you should be able to recognize that little sign and send them out to a doctor. So this is how you do a breast self-examination. And it's also important to practice it regularly at least once a month, mainly because you get used to knowing what your normal breasts are. Mm -hmm. And then you will be able to recognize a new change. Because a lot of patients come and tell this has been lying there for six months, but I thought it was always like that. You know, because they didn't know what normalcy was. So that is important. And um, a very important experience that I would like to share is once in to our hospital, a little child of two and a half year old uh, was brought in by the parents and he had a distended abdomen and he was diagnosed with a kidney tumor. So I asked the mother, uh, since when did you notice this? And she said, it just progressed over two weeks and she was weeping. I was sitting there taking my notes and feeling bad that this tumor didn't give him any time. And then my senior consultant walks in and he asks the mother, so who was bathing him every day? And for a second I'm like, how was bathing and hygiene related to cancer? But what he meant was who was touching the body every day? Who was, you know, yes. touching him regularly to find it early on? Right. 
and then um, she said she's a working parent and uh, the mother-in-law was taking care of the child. So we asked the mother-in-law to come next time and the mother-in-law did say that on the left side it was hard for four months. But the child did not complain of anything and that's why I didn't know it was important. So things like that happen only when you e take time, five minutes, sit down, check yourself and you know, especially breasts and abdomen where you can feel lumps deep inside. So what could have gone away with just removing a small tumor had to be, you know, uh, the, his entire kidney had to be knocked off and there's a high chance of recurrence. So that's how we miss these small signs. Uh, now that we don't have treatments for many of the stage four cancers, we have to, uh, have to struggle on catching it early because there is no hard and fast rule that I can be, you know, um, I'm s I can be cancer immortal. It, cancer can come to anybody, and we've been seeing that day in and day out. In fact, you know, I think Sonaliji was also mentioning a little while ago, you have this belief system, oh, it could happen to the rest of the world, can't happen to me, you know. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you spoke about this little boy, but the reality is that a lot of us uh, women, no matter how evolved we may think we are, we have this conditioning that we are providers, we must provide and take care of everybody else in our ecosystem, we're fine, we'll figure it out, right? Um, and I firmly believe that we are the creative life force on the basis of which our ecosystems flourish and thrive, right? Which is why my question is to you. Yes, <laughs> to you. <laughs> Ma'am is already committed to getting regular screenings done, but would you like to add on to this point? Do you really believe that, uh, you know, a w the importance of a woman in a household or in a workplace is just tremendous and everything around her flourishes because of her? Absolutely. For example, we've seen in generations, my mother, my grandmother was like the center point of the whole family. My mother is, I guess even I am, I think every woman in their home is the most important. So I'm, since I'm saying this, I promise I'll come back from my next trip and I will get my test. <laughs> Literally, that's the only reason I like why I the way she has said after my next trip. She's already postponed it. <laughs> No, but the reason why I asked, ma'am, no, is the fact. It, you are absolutely spot on. I mean, you know, I think each one of us know how important, our families know how important we are. And it's very important that we, if not for us, I think if a woman collapses, the whole household collapses. You know, even if they don't want to accept it, the guys don't accept it, but it's a fact. The kids want the mother, the husband wants the mother, the whole family wants the, even whether to fight or to love or to whatever. We are there. <laughs> I see or the punch bag. To fight or to love. <laughs> yeah. And I see the men cheekily smiling also. <laughs> no, okay, so I'm, I'm actually grateful. Krishna, come in the front. Come, come, come. Uh, yeah. I'm grateful that you, you mentioned this. Like I said, the reason why I was so keen on highlighting this is that we forget, but we really mustn't. So please go get yourself screened on time, okay? But now that we somewhere have women have the conditioning also that you know uh, uh, somewhere even however educated we are and everything um, it's the it's the male in the house is the bread earning kind of a thought process is that and has to be looked after and we has women to be fine. keep ourselves in the back yeah we like so look after everybody but we forget about ourselves and which is very important I think needs to remember about the women so all the men here. Please go back and take care of the women in your family. To remind them that they should go for the checkup. It's your jobs now because they are doing some other jobs for you. Yes. <laughs> Ma'am, since we did speak about families, um, and if you're comfortable sharing this, yes. um, you know, what the person is going through is difficult, but to see your loved one go through this also is, is something else altogether. How was it for your family to cope, ma'am? And I know, you know, Ranveer was very little. No, he, uh, so uh, I think uh, I've always said that I struggled. Everybody does. Like we spoke about the mental health and I took help for it. And, you know, at one point, you know that um, sometimes you can't break through how much ever you might say hashtag this and hashtag that. It's great. But there are times when it's you need the help and you need to understand that, you know what, it's going to an area where I need the help. And then you reach out and take professional help. And in the same way, I would say the primary caregivers or the support system or need help. 
and they need a support group. And so, um, I mean, if your facility also can organize it and all that, if you can have support groups, because what a primary caregiver goes through, uh, only they know because, you know, the patient gets the attention. But the person who's looking after the patient is also yeah. struggling and is going through so much. They're seeing their loved one go through it. And, you know, also there are times when you're in pain and you're, you know, they, they feel helpless. Um, so there's so much that they're going through. And a support group really, really helps. So these are the groups that uh, help you deal with it. Sometimes there are, um, you know, small things that uh, maybe nothing, I mean, doctors help. But there are certain small, small things that um, just caregivers can help you with because uh, doctors come and give you the medication and all of that, but somebody who's looking after uh, them every day, they have certain tips that really make a difference, you know, and it can be the side effects of the medication that um, how to deal with it. Like, you know, when you go through the chemotherapy that I was going through, your, from your gums to your mouth, everything is bleeding because uh, uh, all soft tissues are just bleeding. And now if your gums and your teeth are bleeding and you have to eat, you know, that's just an open, it's an open pore for infection. It sounds gross, but that's what it is. But just a tip from a support group or a caregiver which says that, listen, without fail every night, gargle with baking soda. As simple as that. And I never got an infection in my mouth and it was just that done. So s things like this, which are not very big, but make a big difference. And that's where the support group the mental health, all of that comes in to help you. Because see, the moment there's an infection, it's going to set you back from recovery. Because uh, So the idea is to not let any infection take over while your treatment is going on. So your body can only focus on what it needs to focus on. And this is where all these other things help you with. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's such a, it takes a lot of courage to kind of really share all of this. And I'm sure everybody over here, no, not gross at no. all. My God. <laughs> Not gross, but I must tell you one thing. I've seen in my experience of a lot of my friends who've had cancer, who have uh, got it in the, like in the first stage or second stage, and they're doing fabulous now. Yeah. And I think they've never looked better. This friend of mine, Reena Raka from Delhi, she says, I've never felt so much better, so looked so much better, because earlier she would eat wrong, drink wrong, live wrong, everything wrong. <laughs> now with this, with after her cancer, she, her life has changed. And she's become so, you know, with it and so focused yeah. with her exercise, diet, food, everything, and checking herself. So I think it really helps. A couple of my friends in Bombay too. Yeah. So I just feel in the bad, there's something good which came out. You know, Pinky, what you said is so true because uh, we all say that, uh, you know, like you said, it is very easy if you've been, uh, do, there has been excesses in your life, they're easy to identify. But like in my case, there were no excesses. So it was like, what am I supposed to change? I, I, everything is healthy, so what is it that I'm supposed to change? So then to understand where it comes from, and every time, now there are obviously environmental things, stress-related uh, things, and genetics, very, very important. And what happens is that none of us want to share our genetics and uh, admit to it that it's there, because it's such a taboo thing that, oh, it's in this family. It became, becomes this big thing. But the fact is you're trying to hide it and say that, oh, our family is perfect and we don't have something like this in our genes. But what happens is that the moment you know and you test, if you genetically test it, especially with breast cancer, you know what to expect. You know that you need to look for it. You catch it so much even before it actually happens. In because, fact, you know, there are new tests now which you can actually, you know, pre-cancerous stages now. Not even, bef even before it turns cancerous. So if you have this kind of uh, uh, information, that's your weapon, it's, your, it's in your arsenal, why would you waste it and not take care of it? So genetics is also very, very important. And for me, I would say that, like we talk about healthy food and all of that. See, everything, there has to be a certain amount of healthy, but everything just healthy is not for everyone. I'm sure that uh, your friend, there's a nutritionist who does healthy food will tell you that you know for everybody it's a little different so what can be great and healthy for you might not be the great thing like everybody says for example small example they'll say flax seeds flax seeds flax seeds great they're very healthy but if you have estrogen related cancer hormone flax seeds is something you should not be having too much of so you need to understand and it needs to be personalized everybody is different and 
So uh, in, in that same, like how her friend made a certain change, for me the change was to identify what suits my body, what suits my gut, you know, and understanding and getting in tune with my own body. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, you, in fact, I was going to, I was going to ask another question about it, but now that you've already mentioned it. <laughs> yes, Ms. Sonali answered my question, yeah. I guess. So we were, so <laughs> about the diet. <laughs> And you Actually, answered it better than I would I have. <laughs> no, no, certainly. In fact, uh, we were going to wrap up the conversation with a cute little segment I was feeling very clever about called Satya Ya Mithya. So I was going to pose uh, a few, que share a few statements with Dr. Sneha and she was going to confirm if it's the truth or if it's actually a falsehood. <laughs> she will. <laughs> <laughs> so let's... So is it just true or false or do you want an explanation after that? You can... I don't know. Do we have the time for explanation? What does the audience want? <laughs> Brief. <laughs> Done. All right. So uh, we've already established. Um, okay, let me begin with breast cancer happens only to women. Mithya, is that false? Is that it? Yes, it's Mithya. I think by now a lot of us must be knowing that even men have breast tissue, though very rare. It accounts. Uh, suppose there are hundred breast cancers. Maybe one of them could be a male. And there are certain risk factors. Uh, if there is a male breast cancer by any chance in your family, it could be BRCA related. A gene called BRCA is being talked about now. And male breast cancers are very commonly BRCA related. So having a breast cancer male relative in the family um, indicates that the close relative should get tested for BRCA. And it's more common in the African American race than the Asian race. And uh, unfortunately, it's more aggressive than what it is in women. Right, thank you for that. All right. Um, the second statement, um, this is only, breast cancer is only a very genetic condition. So um, this term genetic, every cancer is a genetic disorder. So cancer happens when there is a gene disruption. Right. Being genetic is different from being hereditary. Hereditary means carrying a culprit gene which is being transmitted from one line of a generation to the other. So you meant is every breast cancer hereditary? Yes. So uh, only 5 to 10% of breast cancers are hereditary. 95% are sporadic. That means it can happen to anybody. Right. That's so true. Because you know, when people say, oh, it's not in their family, how come she has cancer? Yes, but 95% don't have a family history. Yeah, the same. Yes. You always were told that it's, it's only in the family. Yeah. Right. Right. But a lot of times families hide it, you know, they don't tell. <laughs> They say, they, they call it something else and they don't talk about it, they hide it. That's what I realized, that nobody talks about it. And that's why the, having the conversation about it and saying that it's not such a, no, it's not exactly. a taboo subject was Absolutely. so important. Yes. In fact, one of the reasons why we're here, ma'am, and I'm glad that you highlighted that is, the taboo. it is not a taboo. Your body is going through so much. You are fighting every single day. Where is the shame in that? We make productions about talking about, oh, I'm down with the fever, oh my God, my nose is blocked. Why? Why are we hiding this if it's going to save your life? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Shazi, before your next question, because you brought up the topic of taboo, I would like to deeply thank Ms. Sonali Bendre for mustering the mental energy, the physical energy through her journey to put forth her journey out there to public and to break the taboo, right? And uh, what she did to cancer in recent times was, according to me, what Diana did to HIV when I was small. So I would sit there and watch Nat Geo with Princess Diana, you know, hugging HIV wow. patients. And now when Sonali posted her story on Instagram, and I showed it to many of my patients, uh, Sonali, who would sit there distraught at the time of their diagnosis, weeping. And I also had a patient who was threatening her husband that she would commit suicide if she loses her hair. And your post would just wipe their tears. They would sit there quiet when they saw your oh, picture cool, on right? Instagram. <laughs> and they would find this newfound courage from, I don't know where, from your yeah. post, and they would walk out courageously, complete their treatment, and come back smiling. So what 15 to 20 minutes of my counseling couldn't do, yes. your stories has done wow. to them. So that's how much Sonali's story has impacted the social stigma about cancer. And as a doctor, I, it's my plea to the society, if anybody is diagnosed with this disease, do not give them sympathy. Just go give them strength. Sympathy box them, box them down, you know. You might be empathetic and saying, oh, you're looking so tired, but that's what puts them down, you know. You, you have to give them positive energy and not sympathy to 
drive the treatment thank ahead. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for so, it. You know, Sonali, can I ask you, can you share something with all my friends, something which you've never told anybody else, something like, something which A was secret. this hard, like, oh, I, I can't say this, but some experience, something which you like, gosh. You know, I've spoken so much about this journey and I promised myself that I'll be very truthful about it as much as I can be because I really feel grateful. I feel I got so much love from everybody. And uh, the, uh, when you mentioned, what you mentioned was that when I put that post out and it was just to inform that this is happening and I don't want gossip around it. And I thought that would be it. But the response that we got and I realized that it was prevalent in all parts of the country, world, uh, all stratas of the society, all genders, everything. So I was like, why, if it is so prevalent, why is nobody talking about it? Why did I feel, and you know how I felt that, oh, I'm so exposed, I know so much, I've traveled so much, I read so much, that, you know, I should know, and I'm like, I was such a fool, I didn't know anything about this, and it is so prevalent, and that's when I, when people reached out and they started talking about it, and the stories were all of how they were hiding it, be it from their parents, spouse, child, you know, they were hiding it. Some people do that. And, and, and that I just feel that they're sick or And that adds to and the stress. Know, the that yeah. adds to the stress because fighting together Absolutely. is much easier yeah. than fighting alone. Because for me, I got, my support system came with me. Like, like we said, when Pinky came and met me or whatever, all my friends would come. Yeah. We had such a good time, actually, you know, because it was like, I don't know how much time I have. And the kind of clarity you have at that time, I said, no, I'm going to make the most of it. Now imagine you know, thank God I made it. What if I didn't? And I had spent those last few months in a dark room hiding from people. That would be so sad. Thank so you. I was like, this is not what I want. And I'm like, why are we not talking about it? And then I realized that, okay, what is it that I bring today to the table with the, um, you know, uh, it's, I, I hate the word, but everybody talks about the celebrity kind of whatever the culture that they talk about. So fine, okay, if that is what it is, uh, my, uh, what I bring to the table is what they call the celebrityness of it. Then what I can bring is a conversation. Let's start the conversation. So that's what I thought I could do best. Um, like Pinky is doing what she can do by creating, you know, her family is creating, created this place and giving it back. I felt that what I could do was talk about it, start the conversation and get people talking about it. That was my way of like giving back. Yes, I think you and your friends have shown the world how a cancer journey should ideally be taken one day at a time because we as doctors cannot predict and um, you as a patient, every day is a new day, every symptom is a new symptom that can't be predicted. So one day at a time is how it should be. Thank you, doctor. That was, you're fabulous. Thank you. I don't think the oncologists get appreciated enough. And I mean, sadly, in our country. But we do. We appreciate <laughs> them a lot. No, yeah. I'm just happy to be with the three most impactful Thank ladies. You. Thank you. I'm deeply, desperately pressed to continue this conversation. But I know ma'am has a flight to catch. So before we wrap up things, uh, I would like very much to, uh, you know, invite Dr. Lakshmi to come up and talk a little bit about. Uh, right. Yes. And just talk to us about the okay, okay. ladies. The, there's a lot of screening that happens over here. Just hint, hint. She's going to talk to you about that. Uh, very happy, I think very Long eventful, very inspiring, and very motivating evening, I feel, for all of us. Is it not? It was really motivating. And as we all know, and now we all agree, that screening at right time and early diagnosis, taking treatment, and also checking lot of things, monitoring factors during our treatments, and also checking out the prognostic uh, indicators and all that during the treatment part and all that are very crucial for any disease, but especially for cancers. So in general, I can say I'm very glad and very happy to inform you all that all this can be done at our GVK Health Club Hub, at our lab services and at our radiology departments. Everything can be done at our place. I think now we are all aware and the facility is for you. And it's all our choice to just go ahead and as Pinky Madam promised that she's going to have her health checkup, I think we should all uh, take a vote that, you know, we, we are aware, but we have to use the facilities and we have to use the opportunities and go ahead, take a vote that, yes, we get screened at early After stages. my next trip. Yeah. <laughs> Shilpa, can I request you to introduce, we have a, a young artist. Shilpa. Yeah, we have a young artist among us. His art is with uh, threads, and threads and nails. 
And he also presented a portrait for Pinky, and today he would like to present Sonali with one of his art pieces. And he threads. And his uh, few pieces are also displayed on uh, fifth floor. And if you guys are interested, you can take a look at them. And uh, all that he's going to sell today, the entire proceedings are going to go for cancer survivors. And they're very well priced. <laughs> So I, I, I request each one of you all to come upstairs to the fifth floor and have some coffee. Sadhmija, you'll enjoy the coffee. <laughs> yeah. Just see, that's all made of thread. Wow. If you see it from a distance, it makes... Before we wrap up uh, our conversation today and partake in the deliciousness of the high tea that's organized for you all on the fifth floor, if you all have any questions for our amazing panelists, now is the time to ask. I'm uh, going to request a few people to uh, help us with mics. If you all have any questions and if you... Yes, yes. I'd like to thank Mrs. Pinky Reddy. Uh, there's no better person to host Pinktober. You wear the pink in your name. <laughs> thank you so much for this. Uh, it's really important. Uh, two things that I would like to say. Uh, you all must be aware of Mr. Nori Dattatreya, a very eminent oncologist, the first in the country who, has, who is at New York now. And he said in one of his interviews to listen to the whisper. The body only whispers before it screams out aloud. And don't miss that whisper. Sometimes it's important for us to search for the whisper also. Number two, uh, we are the privileged uh, sector of the society. And uh, we have access to information. We have access to mammograms. But the larger working force in our houses and offices are those are the ones who need the help. If you can, educate them. Uh, about routine screenings, send them for screenings, and if possible, sponsor their screenings. That's my uh, little request to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have high tea arranged on the fifth floor. I request everybody to step up, please. Thank you.